Well, hello everyone. My name is Matthew Taylor, and I'd like to welcome you to our first Bush broadcast for the year, coming to you live from our Edgebaston Reserve in central West Queensland, a couple of hours from Longreach. Sat next to me is Dean Gilligan, our freshwater ecologist, who's one of our panelists today, and really glad to see everybody joining us today. Um, this is the lands of the Bidjara people, who are the traditional custodians of this country. And I'd like to pay my respect to the elders, both past and present of the Bidjara, and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians online with us today. And we particularly recognise the remarkable Australian environment that we're striving to conserve, which is on land that has actually never been ceded. Well, as you join, I can see some of our wonderful uh, supporters are already saying where they're from. So please do use the chat to say, well, right, let us know what country you're on. Um, that chat function is also there for you to put any questions in that you'd like to ask, so please chuck them in uh, as we're going through the webinar today, and we'll get to those in a Q&A at the end. This is the first opportunity we've had to come live from somewhere, and thanks to wonderful satellite links, it means that we're in the old shearing shed at Edgebaston, uh, a place that I've been spending the last 10 days uh, with Dean while he flogs us uh, doing fauna surveys. It's actually been fantastic fun and I've learned an enormous amount about what else Edgebaston is famous for apart from those lovely little fish, the red fin blue eye that uh, you've probably heard about. Just a quick bit on Edgebaston. It's hidden away in central Queensland's outback and basically there's a lot of critters here that are found nowhere else on earth and we're going to find out a bit more why that is. It's called an artesian spring ecological community but aside from that, Dean's been introducing me to all the other wonderful landscapes and ecological communities that are also found on Edgy. Our guest today to tell us more about this amazing place um, and some of the other reserves in our North region are Joe Axford, our head of North region. Hi there, Joe. Joe's gonna wave, thank you very much. Dean, who sat next to me in the purple hat, you'll see more of that hat later. And Tony Mayo, our healthy landscape manager for the arid riverine area, who's joining us on the road. Hi, Tony. Thanks for stopping the car and not driving safely while you join us today. Much appreciated. Now, my first question, Joe, I think it'd be great if you could give us an overview of some of the amazing places we do have in the North region. I think it's 10 different reserves, isn't it? Can you give us a sense and a flavour of what it is that you look after? Because it's a very envious, but probably very hard portfolio to look after. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. And um, thanks to everyone for joining us today. I'm on Yarrawarra and country in Toowoomba in southeast Queensland. But you're right, I have a, a really privileged job of looking after bush heritage or overseeing bush heritage's work in Northern Territory, Queensland, and that Northwestern component of New South Wales. Um, and it's, it over, oversees a, a vast array of landscapes and species, really diverse and rich culturally and um, biologically landscapes. In, um, and you can see from this map that Megan's put up for us, some of the, the expanse of land that we look after. In the Northern Territory and Cape York and the Gulf Country, Bush Heritage doesn't own any properties, but we support traditional owners to manage their lands for really great um, conservation outcomes, helping them to achieve their aspirations for healthy country. So you can see those yellow dots represent some of our Aboriginal partnerships. And in Queensland and Northwestern New South Wales, we own and manage 11 protected areas, which cover um, over 600,000 hectares of land and really cover a huge diversity of landscapes from you know, the, the massive rolling red sand dunes and the gibber plains of Etha Booker and Pilunga on Wonka Mudla country to the harsh Spinifex country that protects the elusive and highly endangered night parrot of Pullen Pullen on Mayawali country to the high fertile Briglow country of Carnarvon Station on Bidjara country, the intact Savannah um, woodlands and the milky blue creeks of Yorka and Durable and Waraganyu traditional lands and then of course you know to the extraordinary pelican artesian spring complex on edge baston reserve which we're talking about today as well as our other properties and 
each of these requires active land management. One of the key things that bush heritage does and that we have learned is that you can't just protect lands through putting a boundary around them. In every single context, we need to work across the landscape with our neighbours, but we need to be active land managers doing feral animal control, invasive weed control, good science, fire management and working closely with our traditional owners to ensure their aspirations for healthy country are achieved as well. You know, in Queensland alone, it's, um, you know, it's a highly threatened landscape where a, a biodiversity hotspot um, nationally and internationally recognised as being vitally important for, for biodiversity and especially with climate change, Queensland is becoming increasingly important and yet under 10% of all of the land in Queensland is protected. Um, the landscape is highly fragmented. And so, you know, key to bush heritage's work is not only working across those 600,000 hectares, but it's working within those priority landscapes with our neighbours, collaborating to get really great um, conservation outcomes. Thanks, Joe. And as you explained there, there's some very unique environments that we're looking after. Um, and as I've been discovering in the last 10 days, while I've been helping Dean as a volunteer doing fauna surveys, um, there really are some special ecosystems here and some special beasts. And that hotspot of diversity applies at a micro level to the springs here. And uh, I discovered just looking at uh, and discussing with the people here, the experts, that. Um, Edge Baston has actually been likened to the Galapagos in some ways in that there are it is such a unique place because certain groups of snails and invertebrates are have evolved here in and radiated into different species literally on site within the space of 20 kilometers in any direction which is pretty impressive to have that as a sort of equivalence and being put in the same category as the Galapagos and their finches. Now, to tell us more about this and the incredible array of things that are found here, uh, Dean, over to you. Tell us some of these wonderful stories. All right. So I was attracted to my role at Bush Heritage because of the importance of the springs and the fish. But once I got onto site, I was astounded by the diversity of the reserve. It's not our biggest reserve. It's a tiny little package of 20,000 acres but it's got this broad range of habitats and you can be five kilometers away and be in a totally different environment from the one you were in hmm. 10 minutes ago. Um, I'll come to the springs last, but to sort of summarize the range of those habitats, we're in the Mitchell Grass Downs priority landscape. So about a third of our reserve is Mitchell Grass Downs, very underrepresented in the National Reserve hmm. Network. We've got all four species of Mitchell grass on the reserve. And interestingly, the one that's rarest elsewhere is one of our most common, um, the barley Mitchell grass. Um, next in terms of scale would be our Gigi woodlands. Again, very underrepresented in the National Park um, estate. Persecuted somewhat by pastoralists um, because it invades the grazing pastures. Um, but it's got astounding diversity, particularly mm. bird diversity. So we've got a big chunk of Gidja woodland on the reserve. Um, the reserve has a strip along the northern boundary of the Desert Uplands bioregion, which is characterised in our reserve by ironbark woodlands. Mm. We've got Lake Mueller, which is an ephemeral lake bed. Uh, we've got the woodlands that are associated with the uh, Great Artesian Basin Springs, and we've got one of the most easterly um, large stands of spinifex hummock grassland as well. So all of these things come together in a relatively modest sized reserve and they're valuable enough in their own right. But the crown jewel of the whole reserve is undoubtedly the springs. Up until maybe a year or two ago, they were the site of highest spring endemism anywhere in the world. We've since been trounced by a spring com complex in Mexico. No. But that's a very big spring. So area per species ratio, yeah. we're still on top. Thank so you. Edge Baston is still a winner. Thanks. But as it's already been talked about, there, there are site, a hotspot of endemism. There's things that evolved here and radiated. We've got a dozen species of snail, a flatworm, a spider, a dragonfly, uh, a shrimp, um, Australia, an amphipod, and our yeah. two fish that only occur in the Pelican Creek Springs cluster. 
and edge baston envelopes the majority of the springs in that cluster. Our neighbours have a couple of springs each. They're in various stages of degradation, but ours are on the recovery and they're looking in really good condition. That's fantastic, Dean. And you mentioned some of those landscapes. Um, I've been able to directly experience them both at dawn and later in the day doing bird surveys. And uh, I can only um, confirm just how amazingly rich the place is. Uh, one thing I did want to add, though, and there's a question behind it, which was the Gigi you mentioned is a type of acacia, isn't it? Yep. And I was uh, helping set up some pitfall traps and there was this awful smell of like rotten fish. And <laughs> Dean just said, that's the stinking Gigi. And I went, well, clearly I'm a city boy and don't realize this. So is this, do we know why these trees stink so much? Is there any ecological advantage to that? No, I have to say no. I'm sorry, I can't <laughs> answer that question. But there's a couple of related species that stink. So there's the Georgina Gigi, which is out in our Mulligan yes. Foraging Landscape Reserves, yeah, Ethelbrook yeah. and Palunga. They've got Georgina Gigi. It stinks even more. Perfect. Yeah, ours is only a moderate stink. All oh, right. Um, but even Brigalow, which is in our other produce landscape to the south, that yeah. has the tendency to smell after rain. Excellent. And our stinking Gigi is somewhere in the middle, just a little bit offensive. Fantastic. Well, that's always good to know. So for those of you wishing to travel in this part of the country, watch out for the stinking Gigi. But it is a glorious landscape full of birds and full of amazing wildlife. Um, so in terms of managing the reserve, um, we don't work alone in protecting all the life here on Edge Baston. I know, Joe, our partnerships and, and the way we collaborate with other people is just as important. Can you just give us a bit of an insight into how we go about that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Matthew. You know, key to everything Bush Heritage does is collaboration. Um, we certainly can't achieve good conservation outcomes if we work in isolation, uh, you know, you can see a photo here of some of our amazing volunteers at Edge Baston Reserve. And right now I know on Edge Baston Reserve with you and Dean, you've got seven volunteers helping with the fauna surveys. And volunteers are really the backbone of what we're doing. We just, we could not achieve what we do without them. They're just essential to all of our work. You know, our science team works in collaboration also with universities and um, research organisations to improve our understanding of the landscapes, ecosystems and species that we care for and to really ensure that we're putting good science into our management and adapting our management constantly to ensure that we're getting great conservation outcomes and truly protecting these species. Um, we also work with our neighbours and our M groups governments, many, and cross-boundary collaborations are essential, you know, especially when you're dealing with really key issues like fire, ferals, invasive species, and just your general everyday boundary issues that you have with your neighbours and your broader community. Um, at Edge Baston as well, really key to the work we do is the Red Thin Blue Eyed Recovery Group that Dean sits on and helps facilitate. And this is a group of experts that guide our work um, on Edge Baston, providing different perspectives and expertise. And it's really, it's got four experts as well as Dean sitting on it, covering different universities and different fields of expertise, including Rod Fincham, Peter Unmack, Peter Johnson, Pippa Kern, all who provide a highly skilled level of expertise and meet a couple of years and ensure that we're really thinking about every decision we make is well thought out and it's we're not doing this in isolation you know so all of this type of work is just totally critical to the way that bush heritage works on edge baston and across other landscapes and protected areas yes thanks joe <clears throat> well i've seen there's some lovely questions coming through which we will definitely get to um, we'll be talking about rehabilitation of the wetlands for the redfin blue eyes and the edge bast and goby and we'll be able to pick up those other questions so please keep the questions coming i'm going to turn now to tony if you could come off mute tony and i would love to know in terms of your role as the on the ground knowledge uh, manager and looking after our, our, the whole of our landscapes so can you tell us a bit about the threats and the challenges we've got because i know We've got uh, amazing acacia woodlands. We've got the spin effects, which I've walked through and been prickled by. Um, but we've also got some nasty weeds, don't we? 
Can you give us an idea of those, some of those weeds and what we're doing about them? Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Yeah, weeds are a particular, well, weeds are a concern on all reserves. Um, it's unfortunately something we have inherited specifically at Edge Basin from um, its history as a pastoral, um, pastoral property. And our number one weeds uh, would be buffalo, prickly acacia and Parkinsonia. And as I say, they're, they're a, a direct result of, of its history as a, as a pastoral property. Buffalo grass um, is a native, or was a native to, to Africa and the Middle East and, and India, or Asia, sorry, and first introduced into Australia in the 1870s. It was, a, was and still is a prized um, grass for graziers because of its drought resistance, its ability to adapt and grow in almost all soils. Um, and it's high, it has a high um, nitrogen content, which is great for cattle, and it can handle, withstand considerable grazing, and you know, some would say overgrazing. Um, so that makes it, from an environmental perspective, it makes it a tough, tenacious grass. Uh, it's capable of outcompeting native vegetation, uh, and it creates, by doing that, it creates monocultures, which you know, eliminates almost everything else growing within it. Uh, it's a very hard, um, very hard weed to eliminate. It burns with high intensity, uh, and therefore it alters the fire regimes of, of the local um, local environment. Uh, it's a particular concern to us, as Dean mentioned, with our acacia communities, um, specifically the Mulga and the Gitche, in that it they, those acacia communities are very sensitive to fire. Um, so it's essential that we maintain the separation and prevent the creep of bulgo, of um, buffalo within those communities. Um, the, uh, the other weed, prickly acacia, again, we have unfortunately considerable infestations of that across, across the landscape. Um, it originated from Pakistan and India and was originally brought over for shade and fodder. Um, but it's a direct threat to the Mitchell grasslands that Dean um, was talking about before. Um, as you can see by the photo there, it does like watercourses, but it will grow right across the Downs type country. And it too chokes out and alters um, pasture regimes. So as I say, it's a direct threat to our, our Mitchell grass Downs country as well. Parkinsonia is another imported one. It's from the Americas uh, and it was originally brought in as an ornamental um, plant. Um, it's particularly threatening to waterways. Um, it'll, it'll choke waterways and it'll choke out, particularly our, our um, Great Artesian Basin Springs that, that Dean's touched on already. So these weeds um, require an extensive um, on-growing uh, management program and, and you know, I'd like to say elimination program, but that will be a long way down the track. Um, and it's going to take a strong and committed um, approach from BHA, BHA, which we already have, but it's going to be, take time, both in resources and, uh, and time, yeah, an extensive, over an extensive period. We uh, picture there is showing um, sprayed buffalo, which is, is still probably our best management tool for buffalo. Um, you can see it's sprayed pink there, so we know where we've been. The, Prickly acacia in the Parkinsonia, we're doing intensive programs for that using machinery such as the Marshall saw there. It's capable of, of sawing down the, the, the larger trees and then treating them with um, herbicide to prevent regrowth. Of course, that needs follow up every year. It's very time consuming. Having said that, the machine is way more efficient than doing it by hand, but it's still very time consuming um, and costly. But it is it is working, and we've had great success over the last two years, um, of my knowledge. And we've got programs in place for the next two years as well. Um, they are the main weeds. We have other weeds, um, like Mother of Millions, and uh, and other that are uh, rubber vine as well. But very very small infestations, and we can um, competently and, and comfortably eliminate those again just with persistence and time. Fantastic, Tony. Thanks for that. Um, I had a sort of additional question because I know that um, 
fire is a tool that um, is used by traditional owners and Bush Heritage um, works with that knowledge and does a lot of fire management. Uh, do we have fire sensitive habitats on Edgebaston? And is there, what's your view on whether those fire is an essential part of the landscapes here? I think it's unquestionable that fire is an essential part of, of, of broad landscape management. However, it's, it's very time and weather uh, dependent in the sense that we've got to make sure that there's optim it's the optimum soil moisture, the optimum weather conditions, so that we can allow for minimal damage when we're burning and maximum um, opportunity for regrowth to happen as well without damaging. But yes, we're, we're currently do, uh, working with fire, Dean and, and uh, volunteers and others. We um, did some very uh, progressive burning in Springs country, stuff that was, um, yeah, it was, it was out there as far as thinking and, and, and planning, but it was very successful. And it's allowed, A, it's allowed Dean and the, and the crew to get in and clean the springs up prior to treatment for Gambusia. But remarkably, it's also uh, enabled, um, it's enabled the growth of some, of some threatened and endemic species um, flora-wise as well around the springs. So it's been a win-win situation there. So I have sensitive That's communities, fantastic. yeah, not only the springs, but we've also got spin effects uh, on, on edge bass and, and other reserves. And old growth spin effects offers refuge for many threatened species from night parrots to, you know, to all sorts of other threatened species. And this the old growth spin effects that hasn't been burned in, I think it's 20 or 25 plus years that they deem it to be old growth. So it's very important that we um, protect those old growth areas from fire. And the only real way we can protect it other than the fire breaks is to be burning and softening the fuel load around those areas so that we can control fire in, that, in those areas. Yes, fantastic. Thanks for that. And I understood from talking to Dean this week that uh, burning the springs is something, I know we'll talk to that later on in the uh, webinar, but was not actually considered the right thing to do, was it? But we've subsequently discovered that uh, it's essential to rehabilitating some of these springs. So it's a case of we learn, we learn on the job, don't we? Yeah, definitely. It was um, it was contentious. Well, I shouldn't say contentious. It was just broadly discussed that maybe or maybe not it was the right thing to be doing. But Dean had um, had some good knowledge and some good science behind it, and uh, and we were able to pull it off on several of the springs. And I believe it'll it'll be a good future tool for for springs management. Yeah, fantastic. Well, listen, we've talked about the springs and referred to them, and uh, it's probably time to give the bling animal of bush heritage, the redfin blue eye, it's time in the spotlight. But equally, we're going to spend some time looking at the less blingy animals that perhaps just uh, swim around in the mud at the bottom, um, because I've had the chance to get up close and personal with some of these in the last few days. And the springs, albeit only three or four inches deep, are truly magnificent. And there's some wonderful critters in there. So Dean, I know this is probably your favorite area, Please tell us a little bit more about the redfin blue eye and the edge baston goby and some of the other critters. Okay. So the history of the two fish and the springs goes back to as recently as 1980 when a museum malacologist, a snail expert, was poking around mm. Great Artesian Basin Springs, stumbled upon Edge Baston Station and asked the property owner, can I please have a look in your springs? And was astounded to find that they were full of all these unique snails. Uh, at the time, he also discovered the goby, but at the time, it wasn't so important because it was considered part of a broader species of desert goby. Mm -hmm. And since then, taxonomists have gone and split the goby out, desert goby, into numerous different species oh, yeah. that are characteristics of the springs they occupy. Hence, we've got our own Baston goby. So that was in the 1980s. But then there was a young fish ecologist, Peter Unmack, who read about Winston's work and how important the springs were and thought, oh, I'll go and have a look. And he came up and instantly discovered a fish that was totally unfamiliar to anything else that he'd looked at before. Uh, and it turned out to be totally new to science and that's yeah. our redfin blue eye. Um, so that was only in 1990 that they were first discovered. At the time they were occupying seven springs, highly degraded, they were being grazed by cattle. Um, 
the Great Artesian Basin pressure was low. There were pigs everywhere. There was hardly any vegetation in the springs. So they were struggling. Mm. Not long after they were discovered, Gambusia, the mosquito fish, turned up on the reserve. And that was the catastrophe that led to Bush mm. Heritage finally purchasing the property. Um, Redfin blue eye and gobies are insanely tough little fish. They can tolerate a broad range of water qualities. Um, their generalist diet, they breed constantly, but it appears they are just totally mm. inadequate to compete with or suffer mm. the bullying tactics that Cambogia often employ once they invade a spring. So within a few years of the seven springs, they started to disappear. Um, I think when Bush Heritage bought the property, they were only left in two. Mm. Uh, and then the reserve ecologist at the time, Adam Carezzi, started to translocate blue eyes into some of the smaller Gambusia free springs mm. just to give us a bit of space to achieve recovery and ensure mm. that we're not going to lose redfin blue eye within you know, a couple mm. of years. So all of my predecessors at Edge Baston, Adam, Rob Wager and Pippa, have each kind of learnt steps in the process of how you treat a spring to get rid of the gambusia and allow us to reintroduce redfin blue eye. I'll take a step back though and just note that the gobies aren't quite so sensitive. Mm. They can persist when there's gambusia in the spring, but they certainly don't thrive. The abundances mm. are a fraction of what they achieve mm. if, if they're in a, a gambusia free spring. So really the, the impetus has been on the blue eye, but gobies are benefiting from this whole process as well. Um, and each step in the treatment process is simple in itself and in its own right, but it's labour intensive. It takes a lot of effort yeah. to achieve and you just have to follow the menu, basically. Mm -hmm. That menu first starts with burning. And the reason we had to use fire is that a lot of the springs um, since cattle have been and sheep have been removed from the property, the vegetation sort of became rank and became dominated by things like kumbungi or typha or reeds, which grow to two metres tall, are impenetrable to walk through and shade out all those really unique endemic oh, plants yeah. that are on the yeah. ground. In the old days, when the springs that they were treating were small, they could whip a snip or slash the, the, that, that vegetation adequately and achieve the task. But the springs we're trying to treat now are on the larger scale. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to achieve reintroduction of blue eye into springs where the outcome will be populations of thousands of fish as opposed to hundreds. But that's the big springs. We're talking tennis court to half football field size springs. Mm -hmm. And to, a, to get rid of that vegetation with a whippersnapper is unmanageable. So that's why we trialled fire. And as everyone's already touched about, the results of that have been quite mm -hmm. exciting to watch. So the first step is you have to burn all that tall, impenetrable, rank vegetation first. So you can actually see where the water is. Yeah. Then we still need the whippersnapper step because you've got to remove the layer of vegetation around the perimeter of the water. And the reason you have to do that is if you were to apply your spray, the toxin, which I'll talk about later, half of it's going to land on plant leaves. Mm. So you have to remove the plant leaves so that the toxin you're applying actually touches the water. Because you've got to be quite precise with the... And that's the killer mosquito. Thing. Right. Yeah. And you've got to be quite precise with the dosages that we apply. So we need to remove that vegetation from around the perimeter of the mm. water because a gambusia can survive in a puddle the size of a footprint. So if we miss one footprint well, puddle that's... within the spring, we've yeah. failed. So yeah, you have yeah. to be very thorough. So we whip a snip next. The next stage in the process now that we've made the spring prime for treatment is we build a, a low fence made of shade cloth around the mm -hmm. perimeter of the spring. The shade cloth has to be um, quite fine woven because gambusia give birth to live babies, but they're still pretty small. So we have to make sure that the baby gambusia can't swim through the apertures in the mesh. But the blue eye and the goby larvae, incidentally, are much smaller and they seem happily able to swim uh, through the mesh. So we build a fence and that stops gambusia from getting back in. Once the fence is up, the next step in the process is to use a sullage pump to reduce the volume of water within the spring. Uh, the reason we do that is because the toxin that we use, you need to use a certain concentration of 32 parts per million. Mm. And if you've got a large body of water, it means you need to apply more toxin mm. to get your right concentration. But if we reduce the water level, we're effectively left with just a few puddles in the spring mm. that we only need the minimum amount of chemical to achieve the outcome. 
And this so, is a natural toxin, isn't it? It's a natural toxin. Yeah, yeah. And the slide that's up now is applying the toxin. So the toxin is the ground up roots of a pea plant from Asia and Central America uh, in the genus Deris. It's called Deris dust. People buy it in their hardware stores and use it on their backyard vegetables. Mm -hmm. It's intended for things like cabbage moths and insects, but a side effect of Deris dust is that it's insanely toxic to fish. So Adam Carezzi ran a whole series of experiments looking at the minimum toxicity that we could use that would kill the gambusia, but wouldn't or would do minimal harm to the endemic. The insects. Spring yeah. insects, shrimps, yeah. crabs, snails, flatworms, all those things we wanted to protect. So we've got this fine balance of using just enough mm -hmm. to do the job, but not so much that it's going to do any collateral damage. So again, as Tony mentioned, we have to mix it with dye so that you're aware of what part of the spring you've already sprayed. Um, Usually the fish, the, the mode of action of this toxin, and incidentally, there are native Australian plants that have the same effect and Aboriginal communities mm -hmm. use those ground up roots of pea plants as a fish harvesting tool. And what are the next steps to, to get us to that perfect point? The perfect point, you apply the toxin, um, wait five minutes, most of the fish die in five minutes. Oh. We survey the spring over a few weeks afterwards to see whether there's any fish remaining in the spring. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, often there is. We miss the odd one and we usually have to treat two or three times. Mm -hmm. But then we use the next piece of equipment, which is our eDNA sampler. And we collect samples of water from the spring and send it away to a laboratory that has primers designed specifically to detect mm -hmm. gambusia at very low abundances. And once we get that negative result from the eDNA backed up by no observed gambusia for a six month period, that's when we've, we can acknowledge or consider that the spring is gambusia free. And then that's the stage when we can think about starting to reintroduce our redfin blue eye and go. Wow, that's quite a process. Quite a long time and a very careful process. Yep. But uh, the sort of care I think that's warranted for something that uh, got down to its last spring or two and close to extinction. So uh, thanks for walking us through that, uh, Dean. Um, Tony, I'd like to come back to you because you mentioned the weeds um, and we touched on wildfire, but equally uh, one of the questions we've had is have floods affected us? Um, and I know on the way in here, I arrived late in the uh, day and Dean had to take me on a very circuitous route because Edgy, like many of the places in inland Queensland has had a lot of rain in the last two years. And we have had a lot of flooding, but it is flooding country. So can you tell us a bit about the impacts of floods um, and perhaps just touch briefly on what other pest species we have? There's been a question about whether we have deer. Uh, I think I've seen some pig spore. So can you give us a bit of a, a, a flavour yep. of what else we have to deal with? Yep, starting with the floods. Um, flooding is an essential part of, uh, of, the, of the Great Artesian Basin uh, process as a whole and therefore supports and substantiates our springs complex amongst many others across the Great Artesian Basin. So flooding and rains is, is, a, is a critical part of the whole process. We need that for recharging of the Great Artesian Basin. We need it for replenishing um, springs and, and um, you know, getting rid of or increasing oxygen levels and nutrient levels and all those sorts of things within the springs. So whilst it's a necessary part, um, it also comes with, with great difficulties and creates problems. Um, and I think the main one, and Dean would correct me, but I think the main one is that it allows pathways for the, for the gambusia, for, for the mosquito fish. It allows that and other threats um, to spread, including weeds. So whilst it is beneficial, it also comes with its downsizes. Um, and part and parcel of all that process, unfortunately, is the climate change aspect of what we're going through. And we can expect more and more of those sorts of events. So we've got to be planning for resilience to be able to, to cope with that and to, and to protect the red fin blue eye along with other, other things. Um, so yeah, flooding is an essential part and, and it's something we need to have. It also makes it very hard as you, you've got a taste of and, and Dean knows intimately, is, makes access very, very difficult. Sometimes we cannot get in. We've had reserves that people haven't got off reserve, um, have briefly for a few days just recently for the first time since early December. Uh, these are more specifically the, the Western reserves. 
So it creates access problems, it creates wear and tear and just general operational problems. Um, you know, it's cost us lots and lots of money to keep machinery operating in those sorts of conditions. It's essential to do the work, but it, um, yeah, the flooding exasperates those sorts of problems. So it's, it's, a, it's a positive and it's a negative at the same time, but it's an essential part of, of the landscape, yeah. And as far as other pests go, um, yeah, we, uh, I'm, gonna say, I'm not gonna say we don't have deer on the reserve. We, ha we haven't seen them. As far as I know, there's been no sighting of deer, but it is something that we could potentially expect. I mean, there's deer right across the broad uh, cross section of landscape within Queensland that I know of, never mind the rest of Australia. So, it could be it could become a pest, or it could be it could be come visible on edge basin, but I doubt that it'll ever come to become a pest stage. Pigs, of course, are a pest across across Australia, um, and we do. I think we're lucky at edge basin for whatever reason. We have pigs; they cause a, a lot of damage to spring, or can cause a lot of damage to springs, um, increasing turbidity of the water which you know, basically breaks down um, water quality and increases nutrient um, uh, concentrations around springs, which is not necessarily a good thing. We're pretty lucky and um, to the credit of the, of the crew on ground, ongoing groundworks keeps pigs at bay. You know, we will never, we will never be free of them. Uh, yeah. I think they're the main press. We've also, um, you know, like toads could become a major threat at some stage too. That they're not a major threat at present, Dean. I don't think, but um, they they could potentially. So we're constantly looking out and working towards managing our pests of all kinds. Yes, thanks for that, Tony. Yes, there certainly are cane toads around, um, but uh, nothing like the numbers that I've I've seen. You know, in wetter communities nearer the coast. Oh. Um. Well, listen, that's a fascinating insight from everybody about what's happening here. Um, one of the things that really struck me in the time I spent here is just how wonderful and wacky and weird some of these creatures are and how small they are. Um, and we're still finding new species at the reserve. I believe the striped rocket frog was one of the recent uh, discoveries here that whose uh, distribution range was thought to be much more easterly, but has uh, turned up here. So I'd like to ask uh, a question we might use a bit more in these webinars, which is, I'd love to hear from those of you who spend time on the ground here, give us a couple of your favorite quirky animals, not the, uh, not the celebrity ones like the redfin blue eyes, but the, the more unusual ones that you've come across here. And I might even chuck in a couple myself because uh, I must admit, I've fallen in love with a couple of things I've seen here in the last few days. Um, Dean, do you want to go first? Okay. Um, kind of the most quirky, animal and it was my first trip to Edgebaston as I was just walking around exploring the Gigi and I literally heard something scream at me and I'm a bird watcher so I sort of recognized bird calls this was no bird but it was screaming at me and I hunted around the patch of bush that I was in trying to find where the sound was coming from and I found this animal wedged itself in the, the little crook of a hollow of a tree and it was screaming at me and I, it sort of blew me away because I knew geckos barked or chipped or you yeah. hear you know that yep yep but a skink screaming at you is kind of a unique experience. So that was quirky for me. <laughs> Incidentally, we caught that one yesterday, Matt and I. So yes, that was quite good. taken just yesterday of this amazing tree skink. So sadly, I'd hoped it would uh, shout at Dean again, but it was being a lot more demure for us again. It was yeah. polite. Yeah. Uh, I guess the next quirky one would be the Queensland whistling tarantula, which we get in our pitfall surveys during form of sampling. This is a great big brown hairy spider. Uh, I'm not an arachnophobe, but I, I want to pick one up. Um, and I, when I hear the name Queensland Whistling Tarantula, I just picture that Steamboat Willie Mickey Mouse cartoon, except this time it's a spider driving the steamboat with the puckered yeah. up lips. Yeah. So that's a quirky one. Um, another quirky one would be one of my favourite birds on the reserve, which is the squatter pigeon. Uh, they're unique enough in that they're listed as a vulnerable species and we've got quite a few on the reserve, so that's quite neat. But I was reading up on them uh, not too long ago and a large part of the document was professing how tasty they are. They were using, they were using citations of John Gould and explorers uh, 
bragging about how delicious squatter pigeons were to eat. Now, I haven't tried one. I don't intend to try one, but I think that warrants a quirky animal. Um, that is an excellent story. Award. Yes, yes. Uh, and I guess I'll give one more, and that would be the good old freshwater crab. Everyone gets surprised by the fact that we've got crabs in Western Queensland. Um, they're quite widespread through the Lake Air Basin, but they're almost totally unknown in the scientific literature. Mm. The taxonomy's been done, but nobody knows how long they live. Nobody knows their fecundity. Nobody mm. knows how they move about the landscape. There's nothing known about freshwater crabs, and we've got loads of them in our springs. It was a surprise to see my first one, I must admit, first time. Excellent. But what about you, Tony? Have you got any favourites? Um, yes, I think, and, and touching on what you said before, whilst the, the redfin blue eye and, and the, and the uh, gobies are, the, are the basically the glamour duo of, of edge baston, um, there's that unique aquatic uh, landscape out there uh, supports a much larger array of uh, unique flora and fauna. And uh, one of my favourite groups is the invertebrates, which are supported in the, in the springs, wetlands themselves. Um, and in particular snails. Um, some of these snails are barely visible by the naked eye. Uh, they're there in quite significant numbers. Um, just some fun facts about them that um, Renee and Dean shared with me is that Edge Baston has 26 species of snails that, that only live in great artesian basins uh, in Australia. And eight of those species are only found at Edge Baston. So, you know, they're uniquely um, as rare and as threatened as, as the redfin blue eyes. Um, in the snail world, Ash Bastion has the highest diversity of any of the, of the great artesian basin springs in Australia. Uh, and it has the widest number of species of snail uh, and, and the widest variety of snails. So it's a unique habitat of a unique little um, niche in, in, in the species world. Um, on average, the, the, the smaller snails of edge baston, <coughs> they, um, excuse me, <coughs> they only live on edge baston, they're endemic to there, no other place in the world, and they actually live in an area smaller than an AFL field. So mm. edge baston is their only home, it's their only place of refuge. So, you know, it's grossly important that edge baston remains protected as it is, as a nature refuge. Mm. Fantastic. So you love the invertebrates, the small beasties. Yeah, yeah. They, they deserve more credit. <laughs> well, I, I have to agree because I was going to chuck in one of my favourites, which was a little thing called Dugesia, which is a flatworm, which most people think worm and uh, horrible. But if you get down on your hands and knees in the mud and peer into the two inches of crystal, uh, mostly crystal clear water, these little black streaks are just quietly moving along on the bottom and uh, I don't even know how they feed. Uh, I suspect they just take in a bit of mud and digest, you know, algae and bacteria. But uh, they're great seeing them trundling around on the bottom of the springs as part of that invertebrate fauna. So they get my vote. And we've just had a note come in from Pete Negus, who's also flagged that there's a fluoro green leech endemic to Edgebaston. Now, no one's mentioned that to me yet. So, Dean, please. I've only seen one before. <laughs> I want to see a fluoro green <laughs> leech. Imagine showing that to your friends um, in the evening. So that would be wonderful. And I think also mentioned, clearly an expert on this, that there was um, a cyanobacteria that's only found at Edgy. So you have seen that one. I have seen that I've one. Seen okay. That one. That. okay, excellent. So yet more evidence of just what a, an amazing place this is. So thanks, guys. Joe, don't want to leave you out. Have you got any faves from the area? You need to come spend some time in your gumboots, I think, and then um, find yeah. your favourite. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm not very good with favourites because you see, Matthew, I've got three kids and you just can't be claiming favourites. But um, I was lucky enough to spend time last year with Dean doing some surveys and, um, you know, the red, thin, blue eye. And I think the different stages of its look as it matures, it's quite an exquisite fish to get your eye around who would have thought something so small could be so stunning and so special but that was that definitely took my tick yes fantastic all right well thanks everybody let's get on to the questions because we have a truly momentous number of questions to get through so i think we'd better do some rapid fire 
um, answering of these. I'll chuck these out. Um, and Dean, you can see some of these on the screen next to me, so feel free to um, answer some of them. The aquatic snails, some of them have names. Uh, some of them are actually unnamed and haven't yet been defined. And I've been told that by <coughs> Renee, who's um, Dean's offsider, working as an ecologist and is currently pumping up uh, sediment from the bottom of the springs and analysing all the little snails that are coming out with it. Um, name of the shrimp, Dean? Do we have a name? Uh, Caradina thermophila. It's called that because when it was first collected, it was in water that was 80 degrees Celsius and it was happily living in. Despite being right. Yep. So it loves, loves heat. Loves heat or can handle heat. Yep. Yes. Fantastic. Um, we talked about the deer. Um, the measures being taken to rehabilitate the wetland. I think Dean took us through that in terms of that program. There was a question about how long it took. What's that life cycle? I think you had at least six months yeah. after. We've, we've now some springs. We've yep. got we've got it in the first try, yep. and it's like two days success. Yeah, we've got other springs that we've had to do four times in a row, and you've you, you've got to have a eight week window between chemical treatments. It's part of our permit. Yeah, so it drags out to months and months. But you've got to wait six months after you've treated before Once you're you allowed think, to reintroduce. Yeah, yeah. The last day you see a gambusia, you've got to wait six months before we can put the right. Just to make absolutely sure. Yeah, yeah, fantastic, excellent. Um, a question for whoever about the weed acacia, acacias that we've got. Do they change the soil? And if so, are they affecting native veg? Now, that may be a question that there's not enough work done on as yet. But, Tony, any thoughts on that one? Uh, yes, they do. Um, I, I'm not, and Dan might, might be able to help here, but I'm not sure of the, of the actual scientific. They certainly modify the grasslands by choking out. But I do believe that some of them may be nitrogen fixing as well, Dean. Um, mm. Oh, good question. I'm not sure about that, Tony. Mm. Mm. But Most yeah. of that family is nitrogen fixing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, which yeah, which we creates all sorts of other problems for stuff for um, grassland species that are that are used to possibly low nitrogen levels, uh, and then to be trying to deal with soils that are high in nitrogen. Um, yeah, I'm, yes is the answer, but I can't give you the scientific reasons why. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, Tony. Um, a couple of questions around water in the springs, um, and the question was: Is there water in the spring springs all year? And if not, what happens to the fish when that happens? So maybe Dean, you can talk okay. to the variability. So, yes, there is water in the springs all year round. It's a permanent water supply and it has been permanent for a very long time. That's why things have evolved mm -hmm. here and nowhere else. But if you watch time-lapse footage of the springs, they pump like a heartbeat. During the hot days, they retract. At night, they expand. Then they mm -hmm. contract, then they expand. Mm -hmm. They're affected by atmospheric pressure because yeah. that's pushing water back down. So they vary in size, but they're permanent. Fantastic. And I think you mentioned to me, which is one another question about has the water pressure in the Great Artesian Basin been changing and is that affecting the springs? Yes, immensely. So since they've been drilling bores, they lost 20 metres of head. So the artesian water went 20 metres mm -hmm. down. The Gabsy scheme where they're capping the free flowing bores, we've recovered eight of that meter. So we're still 12 millimeters below natural. But that eight meter recovery has actually doubled the size of Great Artesian Basin Springs on average, but it's actually tripled the size of our springs on Ed Pastor. So we've recovered eight and we've got this massive expansion or recovery. If we recover even more, that that expansion of our springs is just going to continue. They're going to get bigger and bigger, and new springs are popping up all over the landscape that have been dry ground 12 months ago. Uh, we drive our car along a track, and a spring has decided it would like to hmm. emerge in the middle of our road, um, and it's happening very quickly. What a nice problem to have, hmm. more springs. Well, it's a mixed blessing because it does also let the gambusia move around the landscape and between springs yes. more easily. So yeah. it's lovely, and it's creating more habitat, but it's also creating pathways for Gambusia to move around. And I think you told me, Dean, that you've been looking at the water flow across Edgebaston and looking at how to prevent the Gambusia working uphill, as it were, yep. um, through the flooded periods to uh, keep pushing them further and further away. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. Um, there was a question, a couple of questions about whether there's captive breeding populations. I know there's a captive breeding population on Edgebaston because it's right outside the shed here. Um, are there any other offsite? Yes. So we've got 
a Queensland government captive breeding agreement to have a captive breeding facility on the reserve, but also there, there's a hobbyist group, professional hobbyist group called ANGFA, Australian New Guinea Fishers Association. Mm -hmm. Their Queensland branch have a population mm -hmm. uh, in tubs in Brisbane mm -hmm. as an offsite population. Mm -hmm. That was a little bit of a trial, but it seems to be working quite well. And the recovery plan actually have, has an action item to establish offsite populations in a major or aquarium facility somewhere offsite so that we have a catastrophic tragedy on the reserve, yes. that there is that insurance somewhere else that we can lean on to recover the blue eyes and gobies here. That's fantastic. So it's actually am amateurs, but very good amateurs. Yes doing the insurance population professional amateurs professional because one of the other questions was you know what's the role of zoos and public aquaria to help support this sort of effort because yep. typically captive breeding tends to be in those yep. sorts of institutions doesn't it yep. so it's a bit unusual that uh, um and talks really to the origins of science which um or western science certainly is amateurs who got very skilled and learned a lot about it they may have used guns to shoot things to find out what they were in the early days and eaten them as we've discovered earlier in the webinar along the way but uh, we have a much more rigorous process now uh, overseen by joe and tony where um, our discovery of these species and our management of them uh, is a lot more professional so at the moment no other zoos or public aquaria no, not at the moment um do we know how gambusia got here in the first place Again, uh, they got to Australia deliberately to control mosquitoes and the malaria risk. I believe it was the army that did it in the 1920s yeah. or 1940s. But everywhere they've been introduced all across the globe, they're recognised as insanely invasive fish. They'll swim up the wet wheel rut of a car for 14 kilometres to work their way between waterways. They also have this behaviour called rheotaxis, which means swim against the flow. So if there's water running one way, the gambusia are behaviorally driven to swim up the flow right. to colonize right. further and further upstream. So they're just insanely good invaders. Mm. Well, another threat to the redfin blue eye, at, possibly to the edge bast and goby, because it's such a good looking fish, we all know that um, there's a lot of take from the wild of uh, good looking tropical fish. Has there been any issues with illegal take? Um, of either the redfin blue eye or the edge edgy goby no 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 not that we're aware of Fantastic. um but i know that there is a very strong desire amongst the aquarium industry they'd rather have blue eyes in their fish tanks than neon tetras uh, because they're a native fish right yeah oh. of course excellent 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 well i think we've covered a considerable number of the questions i'm just gonna have a little scroll through here to see, ah, there's an interesting one here. I'm not sure if our team is going to be able to have the technical expertise to answer this, but we all know fracking for oil and gas um, has a potential risk um, on the Great Artesian Basin water pressure. Um, is there any fracking? I guess the question is asking, do we know whether that might be having a negative effect to counteract the positive effect of capping bores on edgy? I guess that might be we don't know, but uh, it's a useful question. Um, Cardinal Mine is less than 100 kilometres away, crow flies from Edge Baston. Yes. Uh, so there is scope for impact. I don't think there's any demonstrable measured impact yet, but it's worth thinking about some benchmarking of our water quality to yeah. ensure that if we do notice or mining does start in the district, we've got yes. that benchmark that we can rely on uh, just to sort of point the yes. finger. Fantastic. And there's a lot, good question here about um, climate change and global heating. Um, what is it likely to have as an effect on the reserve? Have we done that uh, modelling to and in terms of thinking about preparation for that? Yep. The question's a little bit ahead of me. They have done the modelling. We The Bush Heritage does have a report on what the likely climate prospects are for the Mitchell Grass Downs priority landscape. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen that report yet so I haven't, I haven't had a chance to have a look at it yet yeah. but when i do it's yes, soon. we're on the soon. we're on the the yeah. bandwagon yeah fantastic yes one of the things we um have done uh, in the last couple of years is get a lot of csiro modeling and data very helpfully from them and applied that to all our reserves across australia in order to determine what our future strategies need to be yeah. um and they vary because if a reserve is going to have some fairly heavy impact we need to be looking at mitigating measures and how we can continue to look after 
those protected places forever um, and what we need to do to help them. And generally, and I think this is fair to say, Joe, isn't it, that the north and Queensland and across the top end are generally the least likely to be the least impacted by climate change and hence act as refuge areas um, into the future. Yes, particularly towards the north, when you get into that Ainsley Uplands region, really important um, in terms of the refuge that they will provide species whilst our climate is in that flux state. Um, so we do know that. So they're, they're crucial areas. And then, you know, you've got important areas like Esbaston, which um, we, that's why we have really strict monitoring protocols. So we can really ensure that we're adapting our management as we go along uh, because whilst we can predict some changes we can't predict everything and um, really we have to be constantly just actively managing and researching. Fantastic well I think maybe the last question um, and this is a chance for Dean due to big note the story of success here how many springs are the redfin blue eyes in now from that time when they were down to one? I think we're up to 16. Fantastic. And the, the reason I say think is sometimes we have wins and sometimes we have losses. Uh, we manage them, but we're, we're at 16 now, which exceeds our Bush Heritage Management Plan target of 13 by 2023. You're ahead of the game. Fantastic. So the redfin blue eyes are thriving, as are the edge bass and gobies, gobies, as are Dugesia, my favourite flatworm, and all the snails mentioned and, um, and named and unnamed that uh, Tony mentioned. So... I think we're in a good space. Um, I'd like to say a couple of final things. We've had a couple of questions about volunteering. So I've clearly sold volunteering on Edge Baston. Um, it is exhausting, of course, but it's a delight to see all the wonderful things that uh, Dean has takes us around to. So if you'd like to volunteer, we do have an excellent volunteer programme. And uh, my wonderful colleague, Megan, who puts these together, will stick a link in and has already done so. Thank you. Um, um, and you'll talk to one of a team of three who organise all the volunteer events. And for the person who had the gumboots ready, that's fantastic because they come in useful, not just for the springs, but for walking through spin effects. Because you, um, they can get through, even my sock protectors, it, one spin effects managed to pierce that three times rather than my skin. So I was very grateful for it. So if you'd like to volunteer, please do that. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, just to wrap up. There, I think we've already talked uh, in the chat that there's a series, a podcast series is coming up soon, Big Sky Country, and that is going to have a session on some of those wonderful snails. So check into that wherever you get your podcasts from. Um, we also will have some stories in our autumn appeal. I think that might be coming out very shortly. Um, there's some wonderful stories to back that up. And of course, if you'd like to support the work of Dean and Tony on the ground here and our particular fans for any of the critters or landscapes we've talked about feel free to support bush heritage with donations uh, if you'd like to do that um, it's the sort of things that uh, dean has on his list like you saw a quick picture of that edna machine that takes the sample for the water we need a few more of those we always need these wonderful feral proof fish fences which are a magnificent height of this much um, not the big barbed wire things just enough to stop the mosquito fish getting in um, and of course, we've got a lot of uh, population genetics work to do um, in terms of our captive breeding facility. So there's some of the initiatives and projects that um, you'd be very welcome to support. So thanks everybody for joining us. Um, as always, if you've got a couple of minutes available, please stay tuned for our closing slideshow, which will have some more wonderful images of Edge Baston. And if we didn't get around to your questions, we may be able to answer them afterwards by providing those to our experts. Thanks everybody again for this first From the Bush. I've certainly enjoyed it. It's hot and sticky in Queensland. I know it's wet in most other parts of the world, but look forward to some more of these in the future. Thanks, Tony, especially as you're en route for uh, joining us. Thanks, Dean, for hosting us and doing such a great job with the work here. And Joe, for keeping everybody in line and looking after us all. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next time. Cheerio. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, everyone.